Today on Straight Talk Africa, a discussion on the U.S. midterm elections. What does the outcome mean for U.S. domestic and foreign policy? What does it mean for the African migrant community and the African continent? That's coming up next, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters in Washington. I'm Vincent McCory in for Shaka Sali. Today we're discussing the just concluded U.S. midterm elections and what does their outcome mean for Africa. Now, the balance of power shifted in Washington Tuesday as opposition Democrats won back control of the U.S. House of Representatives, dealing a political blow to President Donald Trump and his Republican Party. But Republicans expanded their majority control of the Senate, bolstering the president and setting the stage for more confrontation, uh, confrontational politics in the year ahead. Now, viewer national correspondent Jim Malone has a wrap-up of the election results from Washington. At Democratic Party headquarters in Washington, Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi proclaimed a new day in the nation's capital. We will have a responsibility to find our common ground where we can, stand our ground where we can't, but we must try. A Democratic Congress will work for solutions that bring us together because we have all had enough of division. Pelosi is now on track to become the next Speaker of the House, thanks to Democrats like Jennifer Wexton, who won a Republican House seat in Virginia. I've been saying since the beginning of this campaign that change is coming to, uh, to America and change is coming to Virginia 10. And that change came tonight. But Republicans expanded their narrow majority in the Senate with defeats of Senate Democrats in North Dakota, Missouri and Indiana, where Republican Mike Braun emerged victorious. We as conservatives, being led by President Trump, We've got to prove why our way of thinking, why what works in the state of Indiana is going to work for the rest of America. And I really believe I can weigh in on that argument. At the White House, spokeswoman Sarah Sanders said President Trump was pleased that Republicans had held the Senate. Uh, again, most of the candidates that the president actually went in, campaigned for, uh, and who embraced the president are doing well tonight. And at the end of the day, the president's going to work with whoever comes into office. The president's tough campaign rhetoric motivated voters on both sides, says analyst Rebecca Gill. It sort of um, polarizes folks and it gets uh, more people engaged on both sides. That was evident in voter interviews with a Trump supporter in California. I, I agree with many of the things he's done, not everything, but many of the things he's done. I think he's uh, got the best interest of our country uh, in mind, both domestically and also internationally. And with a Trump critic in New York. Yes, well, I hope, we're hoping that he has a bad dream from which we are just beginning to awaken. First of all, by taking the House of Representatives, and in two years, by taking the Senate and the White House. Okay. Goodbye, Trump. In the end, Trump was a key issue for both sides, says analyst Capri Cafaro. There is enthusiasm on both sides, which I think is why we are seeing significantly tight races across the board in these areas that are have been identified as uh, toss-up states, toss-up races across the country. Trump and the Democrats now face a new question. Can they work together even as both sides begin preparing for the next presidential race just two years away? Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Well, thanks, Jim, for that report. Uh, joining us now are our distinguished guests, Abdi Kafar Abdi Wadere, an analyst on American affairs. Amir Woods, Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity, International Working Group member and VOA election correspondent Steve Reddish. Welcome to all of you. Thank Great you very much. You. Now, Steve, if I may begin with you. First, there was uh, obviously enthusiasm on both sides of the, uh, of the divide, and some people are saying there's going to be a blue wave that is going to sweep across the United States of America. What did we witness last night? We saw a blue wave. It wasn't a big blue wave. It wasn't a tsunami. It was a blue wave. It hit a red wall and kind of dissipated into different areas. but. Mm -hmm. 
It was a blue wave. The Democrats took at least 27, and it, the, by the time all the votes are counted, it'd be more like 35 seats in, in the House of Representatives. And that's big. Um, they didn't do well in the Senate. The Senate odds were against them. They were running uh, incumbent senators in states that Trump had won. And in five of those states, Trump won by 10 points. Mm -hmm. So some of the, they lost the Senate. Um, but overall, it looks like when you count up all of the votes, Democrats will get about 9% more votes than Republicans mm -hmm. in this election. Uh, for, for House and Senate and Governor. If I may stay with you for another few seconds. Now, uh, sometimes you've had people say that uh, congressional elections that are actually domestic are about the issues that are of concern to the people of that specific district. Uh, was this the case this time, though? Well, yes, these elections are you know, thousands of little elections across the country and no one singular name on any of the, on all of the ballots. But President Trump made sure, in the, especially in the final week, two weeks of, of the campaign, that his name was on the ballot, even though it wasn't on the ballot. He said, if you support me, vote for the Republican. If you, and, and consequently, if you didn't vote for him, you did not, if you, did, if you voted for the Democrat, you did not support him. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the numbers, it was a, a pretty mm -hmm. big wave, by all accounts, mm -hmm. for the Democrats. Oh, wow. It's, it's kind of a referendum. Now, Amira, you know, though at least uh, we are expected to see about 111 women in Congress uh, after, after the election of last, uh, last evening, yesterday. And now, that includes about 40 women of color from about 38 in the, pre in the previous Congress. How significant is this? So, Vincent, I think this was a phenomenal indication of the America to come, because what you see is a huge voter turnout, people paying attention to a midterm election, 113 million people voting, compared to about 80-something million in, um, in previous midterms. It's historic, right? But what you see is that it's these new voters, young people of color, progressives, not only voting, registering first, voting, but also deciding that this was their turn to run. And they ran and won. So what you will see in this new Congress is a strong progressive caucus, a strong congressional black caucus. Uh, you saw that, 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 that screenshot of Nancy Pelosi's speech on the stage with her were soon to be leaders who will head committees, key committees, not only on government oversight, but homeland security, as well as, you know, foreign affairs. Um, so Barbara Lee on that stage, one of the, actually the only uh, 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 member of Congress who voted against the Iraq war, she now could potentially head a committee. What this means in terms of agenda, agenda setting for this Congress, but more importantly, what it means means for the future electorate mm. in America, I think we, we still, um, uh, are, are, there's still much to be seen. Yes. But it's, I think, an exciting time for Democrats, yes. without a doubt. And Abdi, you know, especially among the immigrant uh, community, and specifically Muslims and uh, Somalis, there is the election of uh, uh, Ilhan Omar in uh, Minnesota. But also there's a Muslim young lady also from uh, um, uh, Michigan, uh, that is uh, Rashida Taib. How important is this to particularly those who have, uh, who are in this country, who, are, who came from elsewhere? Big deal. This, first of all, I want to give them a shout out to all of them because it really takes gut, commitment, and a very determined participation in the American electoral system to, to, to even break into that. And Elhan, who was not born here but actually came from a refugee camp, I mean, this is a very serious leap, and that shows you that immigrants are here to participate to play a huge role in terms of integrating. And unlike the way they are, you know, presented in the media and other places, immigrants are integrating as much as they have always been integrating all over since this country was established. So I think that sends not only as an African-American, um, first Muslim, first Somali-American elected to Congress, but also the 
uh, first woman mm -hmm. uh, Muslim with uh, with mm -hmm. another uh, Muslim person. But I think the most, the biggest, and the most important thing is that young girls all across Africa, everywhere around the world, can actually look into that and say, "Yeah, I can actually join uh, the United States Congress and even higher places." So mm -hmm. I think that's a huge symbolic value for both the Somali and the African Americans of African descent, especially, and the Muslims, and, and the fact that mm. that's the best way to go mm. about yeah. in, in participating in this country's um, uh, opportunities yeah. and, all, and uh, all that it offers. Yeah, and another one to highlight, not to forget, there's a, 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 another gentleman by name uh, Joseph uh, Negusa. Uh, from uh, uh, California, uh, no, from um, uh, Colorado. He's actually a son of an uh, immigrant from uh, Eritrea. The parents came here many years ago. They met yeah. here, and, and, and that's something also very, yeah. uh, very significant, I think. But, but in you wanted to, to add something. These federal races, you yeah. also have state and local races where Africans have taken over. I mean, I think you've got um, uh, Maryland, uh, clearly Minnesota, California, Georgia, where, you know, you have people voting in local races, some school board races, some state delegate races, um, and they've won. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, and, and it's it's across the country. So it's Delaware. Yes. Um, uh, so I think what what you're seeing is, you know, this is the some some call it the feeder team yeah. for the for the yeah. for the party, right? We spoke, we spoke to a political uh, scientist from Northwestern University, Alvin Tillery, yeah. uh, about Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib's. Uh, victories, and he said he, he pointed to American history. He said this is just like the Irish and the Italian and the Jewish, the immigrants who came to America and landed in cities, not just in, on the East Coast but elsewhere. And after years of being here and growing up here in America, they start to run for office, and then they start winning offices. And it is an American um, an American tale of success and how the immigrant community way from all the way back has built this society both politically and socially. And African communities can be also part of that. Uh, you know, in her uh, victory, uh, Elan Omar, uh, uh, as she was making a remark, she said this is uh, a hope of a fear and there was an election also about a unity of a division. We can talk a little bit about that, but I want to go to something she said uh, some time back, uh, uh, as we just mentioned, Minnesota State Representative Ilhan Omar has now, now become one of the first Muslim women elected to Congress, easily winning the election in Minnesota's 5th Congressional District. Omar is a former refugee who immigrated to the United States as a teenager after spending time in the Dadaab camp in Kenya. She tells viewers Jackson Vungani that refugee and immigrant issues are going to be part of our top legislative policy priorities. Let's listen, uh, listen to this. I mean, like, a voice like mine has never been heard here in Congress, so I, um, you know, hope to, to join Congress in bringing an urgent voice, um, a voice that is very fluent on, on the, um, the struggles that refugees uh, are, are going through around the world and the hopes and dreams that they have, um, and, and insist on um, having the United States uh, be, you know, the, the beacon of, of hope for, um, for refugees and for us to create policies that um, allow for refugees to be resettled here for the United States to do its, its share. Yeah, so a little bit of noise in the background, but she's basically talking about highlighting the issue, for example, of refugee, and she's a person who has come from a refugee camp. Uh, so do you get the sense that having representatives like this ones, in fact, will bring a different flavor to Congress, that they can articulate issues that are very, very close to the hearts, mostly of the immigrant community? Absolutely, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a common sense. First of all, to be noticed, to be seen, you have to be at the table. You have to be sitting. And that, to me, is not only critical for the refugees, but the entire African continent and people who are going to be interested in, in terms of its development, social issues, you know, basic things that Africa is missing, you know, girls' education, uh, human rights, democracy, uh, development in general. All these basic things, you need somebody at the table to say, what are we doing? And the good news is that there is a bipartisan, always, Africa has never been a contested kind of some of the immigration issues and all the things that, 
the administration and both parties have argued was not the case. It was always a, a, a bar, bipartisan kind of issue. When you are sitting there, people from there, it simply boosts and provides a tremendous opportunity because you can vis visualize, you can mm -hmm. see it. Somebody who has grown up there, who is representing constituent back here, while at the same time, you know, calling home Africa. So I think it's more than just bringing an issue. There are a lot of people who bring African issues. It's different when it's really you who is presenting it, either in a committee or negotiating with the other side, saying this is what we need to do, whether yeah. it's uh, HIV AIDS or health or education or empowering you know, young girls yeah. over there. Who is a better uh, representative? than somebody like Ilhan, Ilhan Omar with her little, you know, tag to <laughs> their tradition. The symbolic, and, and, the si symbols are there. Yeah. Who so can say, it, I know somebody, I have a relative who exactly. he's probably experiencing touch, something. The, they the can, congressman, yeah. the senator can yeah. feel, can touch, can see, yeah. can have coffee with. Yeah. It's a huge deal. Oh, so right. I think in terms of the overall, you know, African attention, I think she adds a tremendous value. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I just mentioned that uh, Ilhan actually talked about uh, fear and division. Uh, Amira, has this been uh, a factor in the election? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the fear and, and all the divisions, but was that a big factor in determining the, ele the election Well, result? without a doubt, Vincent, the politics of fear was very strong uh, throughout this electoral season, uh, led, quite frankly, by, by the president uh, in terms of, of galvanizing his base. It succeeded in galvanizing the base in red states, uh, uh, you know, um, describing a caravan of, of, of refugees, essentially, as, you know, uh, terrorists and, and uh, as evil and all of these, these very kind of divisive uh, uh, terms, I think, was deliberate effort to, 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 to deliver the base. Mm -hmm. and, and what we saw was that it's not only the Democrats that delivered, uh, it's also the Republicans delivering their base, and, and largely um, a base that was responding to that mm -hmm. message of fear. Um, I think what we see in places like Florida is um, that you know, the message of fear is, is, is limited in terms of its, um, its it, the base can only provide but so much for the Republican Party. I think mm -hmm. over time, uh, what the Democrats are doing Doing is expanding um, the electorate. Uh, so Florida, for example, this was uh, uh, an amendment to the Florida Constitution that expanded the electorate so that people who had formerly been incarcerated could reach over uh, one could, million. Could, could now vote. Yeah. 1.4 million 1 .4 people million. Yeah. were stripped of their rights yeah. of citizenship, and yeah. now that's been restored. That expands the electorate. Yeah. Perhaps it could be, uh, you know, beneficial to both parties. Who knows? We yeah. will see. Most but likely. it is tremendous. It, uh, as, as a step forward to returning the basic right of people to choose their leaders and, and to hold those leaders accountable. Yeah, Florida is a, a very diverse kind of a, a state and always a source of excitement. Uh, but Steve, you know, some have said, okay, the fear factor right. was there, but also to his credit, people say, uh, no, research has shown that actually the economy has been doing well. Yes. Uh, I mean, wage may not, uh, the wages may not have gone up, but the economy has been doing well. The GDP went up by about 4.2%. Mm -hmm. Question is, did the president himself just distract from that? Some feel that he could as well have focused on the economy, the performance of the economy, and, and, and that, that would have been a major issue. And there's, there is reporting out there that um, the president rejected the idea of running the last several weeks on the economy and focused more on immigration because he knew that it would get the people that he um, that that his base supporters to get out and vote and and so far as we can tell that worked he got out the peop the 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 senators and the congressmen who he in who invited him into their districts to campaign for them they all won um, there was only one that did, I believe there's only one, I, I can't remember who it is, that did not win. But, but the president turned out his supporters for those candidates, and the result is the, the Senate, the Republicans kept the Senate. And, you know, I, I, I want to, one thing about fear is that both sides play on the fear factor. The Democrats ran just as many commercials, negative commercials about Republicans going to take away the health care of Americans as as that. And it plays on but but it plays on different heartstrings and on different levels of the electorate. Mm -hmm. And so and so both sides, I think, used the tactic well 
to get out their voters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's an added element of, of fear that, that, mm -hmm. that's kind of overlaid with race. That the that that was played out throughout this electoral season, and and so I th I think um, what you have mm -hmm. is like uh, this sort of coded language, you know, mm -hmm. of, of speaking to the base, uh, you know, which is is, is typically you know um, uh, has typically voted Republican, uh, you know, typically white, typically male, typically rural, um, uh, and and also typically um, not as highly um, college educated and, as and, the other and side. And to your point right? earlier, the Democrats found. The combination to unlock the um, the, the the different demo, the, the new demography that is happening here in the United States, where this year for the first time Democrats up and down the line on on uh, all 140 435 House seats, white men were the minority of all of those candidates. There were fewer white men than everybody else and and so it 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 shows a change in the democrats and the democrats are are finding that lot and the republicans are looking more toward the rurals and they turned out rural voters mm -hmm. quite a, quite a bit this year now abdi you know most people across the world observe and watch the american elections very very closely for those out there in there in, the, in, in africa what should this mean to them? I mean, on the bigger picture, what should an African uh, expect from the results of this election? On a day-to-day -day, uh, issue, I don't think not much. Uh, they won't see something immediate. But I think in the long term, what it means is when America engages, when America participates, when America is in a position where uh, it's less of a, a one party calling all the shots, but it's more of what is in the interest of the goal in which we share, whether that's the environment or it's um, global warming or all the international trade issues, all of those things. I think having a divided power here where the issue and the Americans would look and say, which party is actually an obstacle, which party is doing real work. And, and once that happens, and it's more of a competition of ideas and which policies work and all of that and some of the rhetoric that we had last couple of years is moderated I think that will trickle in mm -hmm. and, and go into the other parts of the world where a lot of issues with the America first policy a lot of things were, were withdrawn so that's going to be I think the biggest advantage is going to be while the two parties positioned themselves in 2020 I think it, it's going to be who is actually there doing the country's business and mm -hmm. serving our globe the way America should lead or engage versus which ones are the obstacles and all of that. So I think uh, that will determine, uh, I think, the benefit for the rest of the now, world. Amir and I know some may say that some of the benefit will come from, say, some of the de Democrats uh, taking uh, leadership positions in some of the committees, which may include some of the committees related to, uh, you know, foreign affairs, uh, African issues. Mm -hmm. But some have also argued that uh, perhaps uh, uh, people don't look closely uh, and, and notice that actually the president's administration is doing a good job behind the scenes. Maybe they focus so much on some of the things he says, uh, which may cause a lot of excitement that actually there's a lot of there's a sufficient engagement with the content of Africa, for example, only that perhaps nobody's looking at that. Nobody's talking so much about it. Is that accurate? Uh, well, I, I think we've got to, we, we could have a whole show to debate just that, yeah. huh? because I think um, it, it's taken two years to even get an assistant secretary of state for Africa who was newly appointed. Right? It seems as if Africa has been sort of a place to look for deal making. Remember the uh, the president uh, last year at the at the United Nations said that Africa was the place where his friends were going to get rich, and then this year he used that the, the you know offensive term to describe African countries. So I think what what we have is an opportunity with people, you know, in Congress that, that were born in Africa to say, that's not the view of the world that we have. And to put forward an alternative view, a, a, quite frankly, a, a much more progressive view of the world. And, and I think the lesson really, um, not just for Africa, but for the world, you know, when we have to recognize it's not only the U.S. with this rightward 
movement uh, politically. It's Brazil, it's, it's Germany, the countries are many now where the right is sort of uh, trying to, 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 to kind of uh, hold on to the last gasp of air, it yeah. seems, uh, for, for a, a, a sort of a racist uh, tinged uh, uh, politics. And I think what, what this um, election shows is that um, alternative views, alternative worldviews, uh, you know, um, can prevail. Um, so let's look at the woman who it will be the youngest woman in Congress, 29 years old, coming out of New York as a progressive. She was waiting tables at a restaurant last yeah. year. Right? I think what, what you see is that women across the board said, no. This is not the world we want to live in. This is not the world we want our children to live in, and we can do better. And they put themselves forward often for the first time, and they've won. So you have, for example, now in a seat held by J.F. Kennedy, you have now an African-American woman for the first time, a progressive woman mm -hmm. who ran a very smart political campaign. She now comes with her worldview to Congress. What that means not only for U.S. domestic politics, U.S. immigration politics, but U.S. foreign policy, I think um, many of us are, are really excited to see. Now, Steve, uh, we had uh, Nancy Pelosi, who is likely to become the next uh, speaker. Uh, speaker again, mm -hmm. uh, saying there is an opportunity here to reach across the aisle and work together. The president himself, today speaking, said this might be, there might be a beautiful opportunity to work uh, <laughs> with the Democrats. Do you see this actually, the result of this election being positive in terms of how the House and the Senate will work together, or this might become now a major source of uh, friction, delays, and blockages? I can only hope so. I can only hope so. I can only hope that um, that both leaders live up to the words that they uttered last night and today, that the time for division is over, and let's look for ways to be able to work together. It, it means compromise. Compromise is, is both one of the key words in you know, defining a democracy, because you have to be able to compromise in order to, to get things done, especially in a, when we have divided government as we do now. Or will have as we will have in January when the new Democratic Congress takes over, um, and I, I, I can only hope so. But again, I think words are words. Yeah. Actions mean are, speak louder than words, and we I want to see before we say, "Oh wow, great! A new day is dawn." Um, let's see what they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, Abdi, of course, there is uh, there's a lot of hope, especially among uh, those in the immigrant community. And what do you think, apart from the immigration issue, what are some of the issues that would be very, very critical that may be served better by a democratic Congress, a majority democratic Congress? Uh, I, think, I think some of the top issues are going to be the global um, movements and things that are happening where where the U.S. had withdrawn pretty much with, with the America First, uh, that many countries are now facing all sorts of um, issues that have to do with foreign interference from other countries who probably, whether it's by default or by the fact that the U.S. had moved on and they have to fill their shoes, are actually, and, and, and I'm thinking specifically Africa, mm -hmm. are meddling mm -hmm. internally and doing all sorts of things where, um, and I take an example of, uh, for example, China, where it's indebting a ton of African countries right now and saying they're doing some kind of a development work, but it's a really weird development when you are taking the resources and you are indebting a country with billions of dollars and saying you'll pay back with resources. Those sorts of things, I think, a more moderate policy that looks at what is American role in Africa in terms of engaging yeah. Yeah. and dealing with these international issues that have gone by the wayside, I think that would be one of the big things I think the new Congress and, and will bring. And we'll continue uh, on that line. Uh, you tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment. Yeah. 
able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. Well, a reminder that we appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook, and you can also watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Uh, now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, is there a leadership deficit in Africa? Does the continent lack leaders who are compassionate about their citizens and believe that strong institutions are equally important? Host Shaka Sali returns to lead a discussion on the importance of strong leaders and strong institutions on the next Straight Talk Africa. Well, today we are talking about the U.S. midterm elections. Our guests are Abdi Kafar Abdi Wadere, an analyst on American affairs, Emir Woods with Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity International Working Group member, and VO election correspondent Steve Reddish. Now, uh, we talked about uh, some of the issues that might be better served with uh, the makeup of the new um, uh, the new house, and and and. But list a little bit just. Try to explain to our viewers, Steve, uh, uh, you have a Senate mm -hmm. controlled now by the Republicans. They maintained control. Right. They made some gains there. Yes. Some people may wonder, how do you explain this? Uh, how is it that uh, people from the same you know, district, from the same states could vote Congress, <laughs> uh, could vote for House of Representatives, but maintain uh, the senators? Um, most of the states, each state, each state has two senators. But each state has at least one representative, one member of the House, because it's on population. The House is on population. The Senate is on your state. Doesn't matter how many people you have in there, you get two senators. So the Senate is a, is a kind of a disproportionate representation and is meant to be a more deliberative chamber. They're more, they're, they, they wait and have much more debate about issues. The House is about serving the individual local people that elected them, and that's who they are responsive to, not the people necessarily in the district over there. Um, so that's how Republicans, you know, states can have a Republican senator and lots of different uh, Democratic Congresses. It really depends on where you live in the population of the state. Mm -hmm. but. Um, what I see is perhaps an opportunity, and especially on immigration, which is the president's number one issue. And the Democrats, if they want to put this issue aside in 2020 in the presidential election or find a solution to it, I think they may be working and try to work with Republicans to come to some sort of agreement on immigration overhaul and be able to move forward on that and eliminate it from the dialogue in 2020 election. Or maybe not. Maybe, maybe they want to not. use it. Yeah. 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 I think because, yeah. because it worked so well. Yeah. I think, you know, in an environment that's as caustic as this yeah. for immigrants, uh, where mm -hmm. people who are desperately, you know, trying to seek refuge with their children are being demonized, I don't think that that bodes well for compromise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if that's the, the starting point of, mm -hmm. of, of, one of, the, of one of the parties. So I, I think we've got to look at other areas. What the Democrats who have won have been saying clearly, health care. That is an area that compromise, you know, has happened, has has brought forward uh, uh, a now an a, a affordable health care for many. Uh, but many who were elected uh, this past night, last night, are focused on how do we push it even further? 
universal health care, right? Um, that's one issue. The second issue, education. These are basic issues mm -hmm. that everybody can agree on. So the, the issue on education is how to make particularly college education free and affordable and, and available for everybody throughout the country. There are some very real proposals on the table. It's been tried now in New York State, been tried now in Maryland, a couple of other states. Mm -hmm. And how do you push that on a national level? Can it gain ground? Can it get support? These are some of the issues. But I I think when it comes to foreign policy, we've got to look at this global war on terror and recognize some of the flaws within this global war on terror and try to see are there are there ways. If you have, for example, a Karen Bass that's now leading a committee on foreign affairs on, on the House side, to what extent can a more progressive uh, view of the world bring about a much um, uh, less militarized U.S. engagement with the world? And, and to what extent can, can some of those those be opportunities to, to move the country forward. The president has characterized the Democratic Party's weak on foreign policy, weak on issues of security. Uh, from what you understand, how is that perceived from outside, from, say, the continent of Africa? Well, it, to me, it's very clear. I mean, the Democrats have simply a different approach in terms of how to deal with the international affairs. Uh, a very good example is this caravan. Democrats and, and a lot of experts would tell you the better thing to do is to go to these Latin American countries, Honduras, Ecuador, El Salvador, all these places, and try to do a, a development work, humanitarian support, create jobs, so they stay where they are, and they work in their places, make living, and all of these. These impoverished people are doing, you know, not, they're not invading USA, but, they're only trying but, to but make the president, a living. Some also say so, the president is, uh, wants those countries to be held accountable. They have to take care and take charge of some of those issues. The United States doesn't have to go everywhere to, to resolve all the issues so people can stay home. It's true, but the be better way is to engage them to do just that, mm -hmm. as opposed to spending billions of dollars um, on a wall, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that won't engage and do anything else. The same would be in other uh, international aspects of uh, the policies that have been happening, where Democrats would just look at it, I think, in my view, in a much more uh, globalistic, engaging kind of leading, as opposed to just saying, it's me, and you go mind yourself, and I take care of myself. Everybody is in their country. Yeah. Then we won't have a global yeah. community. So yeah. I think that different approach yeah. will make the difference. Uh, your thoughts, Amira? Well, so clearly, you know, one of the key issues that's come up regarding the caravan is that a bulk of the people um, are coming actually from Honduras. They're coming from Honduras. Why? Because the U.S. launched a coup in Honduras, right, a few years back, that created a political uh, um, uh, climate um, that has been not only insecure uh, for, for those in Honduras, but also for the neighboring countries. So I think what, what, you, what, what you have to say when you talk about accountability is that accountability has to be for the U.S. as well in terms of U.S. foreign policy um, being held accountable for the very real consequences of, of, of their actions. And so I, you can't look at the caravan that's escaping from uh, you know the, the, the chaos that's been created by the U.S. without saying you've got to all also hold U.S. foreign policy to a higher standard to not um, uh, uh, instigate and foment uh, the instability through, through the coups and counter-coups. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, for, for the Americans, uh, is the, what is more important here? Is it the local issues or the foreign policy? All politics is local. For, the, for Americans, they look at the, at the economy first. They look at how am I doing, how is my family doing. Do I have enough food? Do I have a car? You know, it's really very much local issues. Um, how are my town, my neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, um, rather than looking at foreign policy when making a voting decision. There are ways you can take foreign policy and, and be able to show how foreign policy is directly, um, either directly comes from your local issue or impacts your local issue. But um, when it comes to American voters and, Ameri and how they vote, they vote their pocketbook for the most part, and what 
is going on in their community. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some, uh, across, actually in, the, in Africa have said that uh, perhaps it's time for African nations to wake up, for African leaders to wake up and do things that would make a change in their own countries instead of just looking to America for solutions, for Euro, to Europe for solutions. Now look, they have uh, opened the doors to China and then suddenly people are starting to realize this is not uh, necessarily the best idea. Would perhaps a strong position by someone like President Trump maybe be helpful to Africa? Where he's saying, look, it's America first. You should make Africa first and do your thing as we do our thing. And then, you know, hopefully we have a better world. Yeah. Well, that assumes every country is isolated and it lives its own little pocket. And, yeah. and that doesn't absolutely makes no sense to isolate it. America has thrived and has actually in the last 70 years I think what created American prosperity yeah. was what they were doing in international tra trade, leading all the key issues around the world, whether it's the global trade or developing other countries where countries like Korea were actually poor at some point, South Korea I mean, and the United States invested in it, rebuilt it, and now it's one of the trading partners. So I think that whole approach that you be on your own and I'll be on my own, therefore you'll come up with your own better leaders, better solutions and all of that. No, I, I think what's going to happen is every time America vacates that position, that leadership, after all, it's the single global power. You don't, don't forget single superpower, I mean. You've got to have some other bad actors getting in. And I can give you a very good example in my own native country, where, in Somalia, I mean, where you have actually all kinds of proxy wars going on between UAE and Qatar and uh, uh, Egypt and all kinds of other uh, actors who are, including China and many others, who are just going and trying to take all kinds of initiatives that are neither good for America nor Somalia nor the global stability where they're exploiting it and creating not necessarily African leaders mm -hmm. but messing up with in a ways that America, which has always looked at things in a more accountable way, isn't doing it. That's even worse if you look at it in those other you interferences. You talk about proxy wars, you talk about Yemen and other places, yeah. but Emira, yeah. what do you think? I mean, someone said perhaps there should be more of a, of a, 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 a kind of a changed relationship, like the, the, the engagement between Africa and the U.S. should change and uh, become less dependent but more of collaborative and that perhaps President, Bull, uh, President uh, Trump might help Africa to kind of get to that position where they engage in a much better way than being just waiting to receive. Very quickly before we go to, we go to break. Hard to see the benefits of President Trump on Africa right now. I think the deal making and the push for um, sort of an unregulated economy, uh, I think, I think could be detrimental. I think some of the trade wars against China could be detrimental to the global economy. We have to see how that all plays out. Uh, so I think we're, the, the jury is still very much out. I think the issue is, can this new Congress um, be able to at least carve out a space for U.S. foreign policy that's going to promote more? Human human rights, uh, more just uh, uh, social justice that's going to pay attention to issues of climate change. These are some of the, the concerns um, uh, that, that Congress should mm -hmm. be able to at least weigh in on. And we'll continue with our conversation. You're tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them. Today, not tomorrow. So let's connect. Let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. 
Well, Steve, and you may want to add on to what was being uh, uh, discussed earlier, but I wanted to ask about um, uh, the significance of this election overall. We always expect uh, that in the midterms, the party that is in power loses some seats, mm -hmm. most times, in fact, in both Senate and Congress. In this case, uh, the, the Republicans maintained. Why are we so surprised? I mean, why should it be so surprising that, uh, you know, the Democrats have taken, uh, taken the House back? The expectations going into this midterm elections was that the Democrats would take back the House and that taking back the Senate was a reach for the Democrats. And polls started coming in in the last week and the President of the United States started campaigning and started turning up some uh, red meat rhetoric and I think expectations started rising. When the expectations were, were high, that they were, go they were gonna retake the House, they started getting higher. And so I think after what happened last night, which was met expectations. Yeah. Well, meeting expectations meant that the predictors predicted correctly, mm -hmm. for the most part, and um, we got the result that we that we expected. I think there were a lot of hopes that were raised, um, and uh, especially as results started coming in t uh, at night, because there are some, even though the Democrats lost the Texas Senate race, there are pockets of um, hopefulness for the Democrats there that perhaps they can turn Texas blue. Mm -hmm. But overall, I think the night was, everybody met expectations, and I do think that the divisions in the country expanded just a little bit mm -hmm. more. The Democrats so. got more seats, the Republicans got fewer seats, but they got more in the Senate, and Things the, positions, just... the positions may have gotten hardened, <laughs> even though just a little while ago yeah. we are talking about opportunities for yeah. compromise. Wow, that is not very encouraging. Now, Amira, you know, you, you sound very pessimistic when it comes to the current administration and Pessimist. its engagement <laughs> with Africa. But uh, uh, look back, a few years ago, talk about, what, eight years ago, more than eight years ago, we're talking about uh, maybe uh, 12 years ago. The Democrats had both the House and the, they had the, the, the Senate. They controlled everything. We had a Democratic uh, president. What is it that was done for the continent of Africa that kind of somewhere along the way uh, has been undone? Or you could look back and say, if only things could have continued that way. What is that? Oh, Nostalgia. so, yeah, there's, there's a lot that was continued. Uh, the push for the U.S.-Africa command, I think, uh, you know, continued to Democrats and Republicans. I think the global gag rule has been one where uh, particularly funding for women's health, women's health programs around the world has been cut. Uh, uh, eliminated completely, but uh, in, in certain areas. I think this has had some detrimental impacts on women's lives and women's health around the world, not just in Africa. I think that's one clear example. I think the other one is climate change. I think where um, you have the African continent at the epicenter of the climate catastrophe, having an administration that is, is made up of climate deniers, I think has been uh, incredibly harmful. Um, and yet there have been efforts at the state level to reverse some of those uh, uh, trends. So, you know, so I, I would say, you know, there's some areas where um, we're ho hopeful that not only a, a democratic-controlled Congress, but a, a progressive Democratic-influenced um, Congress will have a greater uh, sway on some of these core issues. Mm -hmm. Abdi, you mentioned Somalia, your native country, my neighbor. Uh, we have seen the U.S. engage there since the time of President Obama. Uh, have you seen any disengagement since President Trump came to power? Because uh, what we've been reporting is that there's been still collaboration with the Somali government. Uh, not really. It, it, it has always been the previous administration was very focused on the counterterrorism, and that's what they were spending most of their time. I think what this administration did had actually continued that, but also continued to support the Somalis to kind of reconstitute themselves, to support the governance and basic things, and of course humanitarian has always been big. So I don't see in terms of huge disengagement, actually in terms of the counterterrorism, they even doubled down on that one, I would say. But the, uh, what's not 
fees available or seen to the people is the amount of um, support that's not advertised that the U.S. has been trying to make sure that the neighbors and peoples uh, around the other countries around and all of that to let it go and make sure that this country kind of comes out of this civil war and all the all the issues that were so not too visible, but I don't think there there's any much change from the previous administration mm -hmm. in terms of what was being done in yeah. terms of engagement. Still, if we were to use these elections and uh, make it like a so, uh, uh, um, use them as a focus, mm -hmm. can they tell us anything about what could happen in 2020 in terms of the psychology of the people if this could be used to tell uh, what can possibly happen? I think you. Political scientists are going to dig into the elect to the results, especially um, in in states where Democrats have either taken House seats. Texas is one of them. They they flipped three in Texas, California they flipped flipped more, and in the Midwest. Um, I think that what what you might be seeing is Democrats trying to win back um, the the Midwest and. Republicans getting even more entrenched in the South. Mm -hmm. And Amira? I think we're waiting to see what happens in Georgia. In Georgia. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> the That's fact right. that Georgia yeah. was as close as it was, uh, let's remind everybody that Georgia um, has, uh, has a candidate still, mm -hmm. it's, 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 no one has yet accepted or conceded, um, that, uh, that could well be the first uh, woman governor, first African American woman governor in the mm -hmm. United States, um, and um, her her opponent, a uh, uh, Republican, was uh, Secretary of State, and and so there were all kinds of issues with people being tossed off the voter rolls uh, uh, going up to this election, and that it has come this close uh, to what could mm -hmm. well be a recount, uh, uh, maybe a runoff. We're still uh, waiting to see what how, how this unfolds. Is amazing because the Democrats controlling a, such. A, a, a red state as Georgia was unheard of a decade or so ago. And I think it, it shows these changing demographics. It is the uh, the African American community, the the, the mm -hmm. Latino Latinx community, as well as the immigrant community that has mm -hmm. ha, that has um, emerged in the electoral um, uh, process in 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 Georgia. You're so absolutely I think right about Georgia, and I, I, that's that, and even Florida, and how close An uh, Andrew Gill Gillum came to winning the the uh, governor's house shows you change right there, demographic I, I, change. I, I think that's there's more of that to come in 2020. Yeah. So I'm yeah. ultimately optimistic. Vincent. Even Texas wasn't a e e very easy win, although no, it right. was significant. But yeah. uh, if I, you know, Amira, if I may stay with you, you know, sometimes winning can be on its own uh, dangerous, uh, depending on how you use it. Uh, is it possible that the president can, depending on how the uh, Democrats behave in the House, could use it actually against them, in, in, especially if they appear to be blocking, they appear to be uh, kind of uh, impeding some of his uh, suggestions. He could blame them for anything that goes wrong and therefore become a disadvantage to them in 2020. I think the credibility of the president for Democratic voters <laughs> is very low, right? So I uh, think it's much more... You might be talking about independence and Well, and, I think and it's others. much more the case that the Democrats have to stay focused yeah. on those key bread and butter mm -hmm. issues. Health care, yes. yes. <laughs> you know, primary for everyone. I think um, making sure that the gains won are, are sustained and that they're pushed even further. I think there's, there's a progressive agenda for Democrats that could happen under this Congress. And if, if that continues to unfold the way uh, many of us hope, then I think it bodes well for the two mm. years and then the 2020 yeah. elections. I, I, think, I think it's going to depend on what approach they take in terms of the Democrats viewing the, the next 24 months as collaborate, work with the president. He has already given some kind of olive branch, I think. And try to work with him on infrastructure, health care, you know, all the things that they, that's very dear to them, and then continue to try to build along that way. Mm -hmm. Do they view that as the winning streak versus the right, uh, the left progressive wing that is basically came here to fight mm -hmm. and fight hard? So I think that will determine how 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 much the president responds to that how much of that olive branch he carries with him versus how much he goes to the other extreme as well and i think depending on the two strategies of the two parties i think that um, will take a while to know
that will determine how, how it doesn't how pull back the olive branch. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's mixed analogies, but it's a Trojan horse. <laughs> it's interesting you raise that because Republicans, Republicans would punish those other Republicans who would try and work with Democrats. I'm interested to see if Democrats will punish fellow Democrats who try to work with Republicans. Yes. And, and, and you know, we're, we're getting winding down, but uh, in, in terms of uh, some of the key uh, issues like health care, to what extent can things now be turned back and go back to the Obamacare? I don't think you're going to find health care uh, anything as far as, as far as Obamacare was. I don't think you'll see much movement on health care. Um, the, the Democratic Congress obviously will try and, and put through some bills, forcing the Senate to either reject them outright or find some compromise. And then maybe it goes to the president. Mm -hmm. Amira, do you see perhaps what the wave that has been witnessed, especially with the election of uh, a significant number of women, as perhaps a good uh, uh, indicator of uh, possible female president and the next elections, a female candidate for presidents? I think we will see candidates that are women across the board, from local to state to national to even the highest office. I think you will see that in 2020 and beyond. And I think many of them will be women of color. Oh. Okay, Abdi, perhaps uh, you see something that in terms of uh, the migrant community being going up all the way to, uh, you know, such uh, positions as the presidency, yeah. senators. Very, uh, yeah, I think quite possible because yeah. what's happening right now is even the Republican side is embracing. I mean, you know, there was a Republican senator just uh, elected um, also, um, um, and uh, there are movements towards, you know, there was a poll of some 68 percent of women uh, basically siding with the Democrats. Mm -hmm. So I think the Republicans would have to ha somehow shift and say, look, mm -hmm. we can't let the, half the country just be completely against us. So I think we would see both sides. I think we will see a, a lot of both immigrant women and an American, you know, native born Ma making headway in terms of pushing women's agenda and making sure that uh, that's done uh, at the highest levels possible, but also the Republican Party responding to try to to expand their tent. We I have think very few seconds left. I want to ask you, each of you, to say what you would want to say as your last word on this topic. Steve first. Um, Democrats are ascending. Republicans are regrouping. Uh -huh. Amira? Uh, it, Democrats must continue to expand the base. I think it will be, um, it will bode well for the country as well as for the world. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing, uh, the question in my mind is do we go to fight in the negative sphere or the country shifts a little bit, try to go do compromise and reconcile and spend more time on country's business as opposed to the party business. That's mm. really what I'm trying to get an answer to and see in the coming months mm. what happens. All right. If you had an opportunity, Mira, to speak to both uh, President uh, Trump and uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi as they prepare now to lead the country in their different areas, what would you say? I would encourage Nancy Pelosi to look to uh, reflect uh, in the leadership of the of the of the House, uh, these new th demographics, the, both yeah. the new Congress uh, women and Congress yeah. people, the people of color, the immigrants, uh, they should be reflected yeah. in the leadership. Yeah. The progressives should be reflected in the leadership. Uh, to uh, President Trump, uh, I would say that you know, uh, continuing to even to speak uh, this politics of race is, is in incredibly mm -hmm. limited yeah. and will have long term repercussions for the okay. Republican Party. Well. Well put, and on um, that note, thanks to our guest, Amira Woods, Abdi Kafar, Abdi Wabdere, and viewers, Steve Reddish. Uh, now, thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, for many of our Voice of America radio affiliates. Learning English is coming up next, and tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Butty. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. From all of us here in Washington, good night. <laughs>